see her. Yeah, are we ready to go? I can't see her. Okay. If everyone could take a seat. Thank you so much. Um, I've been asked uh, to introduce uh, the next three speakers. Uh, we are beginning with Nando Pelusi, PhD. He's a founding member of the Applied Evolutionary Psychology Society and a clinical psychologist with a private practice in New York City employing cognitive behavior therapy with insights from evolutionary psychology. He wrote a regular column entitled Neander Think, I love that, for Psychology Today, exploring the psychological implications of living in a modern world from, an evol from evolved strategies to mismatched theory. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. So the founder of cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, Albert Ellis, once let me in on his operating principle, and that is that all humans are crazy. We're arrant screwballs of the worst sort, crybabies who will suffer forever. And that was on a good day. I worked uh, under him and along with him uh, for about 20 years. And uh, here he is singing a, an original song about the hopelessness of marriage at my wedding. <laughs> he believed we had to dispute our irrational beliefs. Uh, and that's true enough, uh, but it wasn't sufficient because even after lots of therapy, humans would backslide into this emotional muck. And uh, the model was like uh, emotional plaque on your teeth. You know, you brush away the musts every day uh, with formal disputes. So, you know, when I asked them why, why are they so crazy? Humans, that is, as, you know, as if we were, we were exempt. He'd yell, they just are. In other words, it was sort of a mystery, or, or it didn't matter. Uh, he even wrote a monograph called Backsliding, uh, and a book called Overcoming Resistance to deal with this. Uh, and the solution was to do more therapy and self-therapy. So CBT has as a premise uh, that we have automatic thoughts that are distortions, and irrational beliefs that if we erase them or we replace them, we'd be rational. Uh, but there's just one problem with this otherwise helpful approach. And the problem for CBT is the solution for life itself, uh, which is evolution. Over millennia, selection sculpted not only our bodies and our mentation, but also our, mi uh, 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 our minds and mentation, is, uh, is what I meant. Uh, so here's where we are. This is a quick cartoon showing what I think is going on. And the CBT model is that you can rewrite the scripts of your thinking. It's, and it's become popular in, in, in self-help uh, as a premise as well. But many of the emotions we have are not just the result of conscious thinking. They're implicit. Um, that's because most of the thinking has been done for us through natural selection. So these emotional smoke alarms that relate to uh, evolutionarily salient uh, issues and situations. Uh, they're like detectors when alarms going off sometimes, but some of them are fine-tuned and nuanced, and some of them are blunt and clanging. So what I posit is that if they are adaptations and um, a result of either a mismatch, we'd better know uh, what's going on. And, uh, you know, matters of survival, and uh, affiliation, matters of mating and status. Um, these emotional reactions uh, might seem like distortions when we're upset, but they might serve a deeper rationality. So some of these are classics, um, you know, jumping to conclusions. Uh, they might make us uncomfortable, especially if they're related to connecting emotionally with others or figuring out distinguishing friend or foe which is uh, sort of a, uh, an implicit backdrop. Uh, so they might cause us some distress. Now, I have to say, as a licensed psychologist in Manhattan, uh, the way we define rationality is your agreement with me. But the research coming from evolutionary psychology 
even though it's often misrepresented, um, because there are various strands, there's not just one monolithic approach, um, is basically um, an attempt just to understand our minds and emotions in the bias and our biases in light of the selection processes that shape them. So if you're messing up your moments and your life, therapy is good. Um, it uses what Daniel Kahneman calls slow thinking. So the so-called fast thinking is intuitive. The slow thinking is a deliberative, rational approach. But here's a catch. Slow thinking is, how do I put this? Slow. It's clunky. Uh, and can overshadow your confidence in fast, that is, evolutionary thinking. Um, it's like driving forward while, while only scanning the rearview mirror. It might make you smarter about the past, but not necessarily about the present or the future. So, for example, it's ultimately meaningless uh, to say that one needs a general, unconditional acceptance of yourself and others, because what you want is a selective, supple, uh, muscular response to challenges of, of adapting to the everyday environment. Uh, otherwise, you live in um, uh, a tamped down emotional state. Uh, I, I get a lot of uh, psychological insight, not from psychology these days. It's mostly from evolutionary uh, thinking and also um, Nassim Taleb's concept of optionality, which uh, gives clients uh, real tools for understanding uh, dynamical circumstances and choices. Um, so the focus on the self in psychology is like driving at night. Um, we're driving again. Um, with the light, headlights turned toward yourself instead of out on the road ahead. So how do we change that? So my concept is that when therapy is useful, it's because it's aligned with an evolutionary salience. Um, the biologist Dobzhansky said, nothing in biology makes sense, sense except in the light of evolution. But I posit that the same is true for psychology and psychotherapy. We just don't know it yet. Um, so there's feeling better and there's getting stronger. So if we distinguish between evolved function uh, and uh, the manifest epiphenomena that, that psychologists look at. Some silly behaviors might serve a deep rational function. It's like stay hungry, stay foolish. Uh, so we have answers to why, uh, and if not answers, then we have clues. Uh, so it's not that it doesn't matter. We have some clues about why we do certain things. So we need not to medicalize or, or compulsively run from the entire palette of, of our impulses and our emotions, uh, but to embrace our ecology with a clear eye. And you know, I follow best practices in uh, cognitive behavior therapy. I'm a supervisor in it. Uh, and I use research from evolutionary psychology, because it's well established. There are thousands of studies. I'm uh, sort of a scavenger. Uh, as a heuristic, you know, as a meta theory. It's like a, it's like a magic eye 3D that suddenly illuminates what um, someone is doing, and I always uh, check it out with, with clients. So here's my position. Some circumstances are evolutionarily familiar, meaning that um, we're adapted to the situational nuances without conscious deliberation. Uh, and many circumstances are evolutionarily novel, meaning that our ancestral adaptations may or may not be so good, but we better distinguish them so that uh, we don't indulge in uh, protective pessimism. Uh, and research shows that um, that does have a, a lot of uh, disadvantages, as uh, Alex mentioned. Um, and it has disadvantages on flexibility, creativity. It makes us negativistic, more negativistic than we have to be. So I have a very technical slide I want to show you. Some evolutionarily familiar challenges are defenses. They require our defenses or adaptations. Uh, and they provide sort of a compass for responses and behavior. 
Um, and some are novel. And um, these are not hard categories, by the way. Um, this is just sort of my um, sense of, of the heuristic and how I uh, distinguish defenses from disorders. So for example, uh, you might have some dif anxiety about, let's say, approaching a desirable potential partner that's evolutionarily familiar. Um, but if it's, if it's uh, in an elevator uh, and you're kicking Jay-Z, you know, it could be evolutionarily novel, although that's also sort of familiar. Um, if you're immobilized and you're phobic, uh, you know, you could be, it, could be, it could go into a disorder. I have disease there, but... Um, now, you know, if you, if you distinguish things in that way, you might see that some so-called inappropriate emotions might be defenses and not disturbance. Some so-called appropriate emotions, like calm and serenity, uh, might actually be a detachment from the fine-tuned unconscious calibration uh, that we have. So I feel like sometimes like, a, like I'm a, a, a punk rocker kicking a hippie. Um, but, but jealousy, anger, depression, you know, are universally labeled as inappropriate. Uh, even when they evolve to solve problems of survival uh, and to detect evolutionarily salient and believable information. Uh, that's not to say they're right, uh, but we'd better not use a hammer on every emotional nail that we don't like. So uh, curing us of general irrational thinking might be flawed uh, when it comes to understanding emotions, because irrational thinking is not something we have, it's something we, we practice, it's ongoing. Now, my clients want to feel good and do better in life. And uh, standard social science is, uh, you know, still coming up with sort of just-so stories about um, why that happens. And they're still asking the same questions, you know, do we dispute the musts? Uh, what's primary musts or distortions? Um, what's appropriate? Do we give homework? How do we get reimbursed for this? Uh, so even though evolutionary hypotheses that I posit can be wrong, and I'm open to getting them challenged, uh, they're an improvement over the ad hoc villains of social science like culture, patriarchy, capitalism, upbringing, sexism, refrigerator moms, underfunded schools, and violent cartoons. So let's look beyond the mechanism and look at evolved function. Um, people are focused on the mechanism. You know, I'm depressed, I'm upset. But when we examine the evolved function, what we avoid is the problem about a problem. So people sometimes get upset, then they get upset about getting upset. They get depressed, they get depressed about getting upset. So the mind is, isn't a chalkboard on which you can easily rewrite for a reason. Uh, it's designed to be believable. Uh, we send signals to others and receive signals. Now, I have to say, I like the happiness research in general. It, 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 they're, they're coming around to evolutionary psychology explanations. Um, although um, my sense is that what we want is um, not just happiness per se, because if you agree that clinically it's not just how good you feel in the present, uh, but how you feel good. It's some things are really good for you, but hammering the, the, the smoke detectors um, uh, might be the same thing. You're, you're just not distinguishing feeling better from getting stronger and uh, more resilient. So this is a common view uh, uh, that you probably know, uh, the common view of evolutionary psychology. The African savanna, where most of our ancestors for 90% of our history emerged. Uh, this is my, near my office in Midtown. Uh, and this is at night, 24-7. So the mismatch is not better or worse necessarily. So what we want to avoid is the accusation of the paleo fantasy. Uh, this is just one version of evolutionary psychology, and it's not dispositive. So 
you don't have to commit to any specific ancestral hypothesis to accept evolutionary thinking about our, about our uh, circumstances. Here's another um, quick cartoon about <laughs> something we definitely lost. So what I want to say is that the systematic differences between our ancestral environment um, and our current are not neutral. That's why the, the, the pa uh, paleo fantasy attacks are incorrect. Um, because we do know things about our ancestors. Uh, we know something about their environments. We know they lacked agriculture. Uh, they lacked contraception. Uh, they lacked high-tech medicine, uh, rifles, mass media, mass-produced goods, money, police, armies, communities of strangers, the internet, smartphones, anonymous congestion, and uh, easily available high fructose corn syrup 24 hours a day. What critics of paleo don't understand um, is that these are not neutral differences. So I want to say it's not that we can't handle evolutionarily uh, novel circumstances for a while. Even tigers can adapt to jumping through flaming hoops on cue with booming music and lasers. But as Robert Schimmel said about Siegfried and Roy, it's just a matter of time before a tiger says, this shit ends tonight. <laughs> our desires and our designs aren't always what's best for us. So we can turn mysteries into theoretically solvable puzzles. Uh, that's part of the science of finding out why we do what we do. Uh, so this is research from evolutionary psychology. You can see how it, it can be applicable in a clinical setting. We may have superficial rationality versus um, deep. Decision making often has evolutionary goals that are implicit. Psychology focuses on proximate goals, like you know, um, what do you say in a specific circumstance? What do you not say? How do you behave? And it neglects the bigger picture. So human decision making is designed to achieve very several, uh, sometimes competing evolutionary goals. So, oops. Uh, so you might not cure yourself of all ra irrationality, but as David Sloan Wilson said, evolutionary thinking makes you smarter. <clears throat> uh, you naturally start to think in trade-offs, not absolutes. Um, you use population thinking rather than strict categories of uh, disturbance, not disturbance, inappropriate, appropriate. Uh, you're not tripped up by perfectionism, not because it's better or makes you happy, but because it's a meaningless concept in evolutionary terms. Um, so we accept the random upsides and look for opportunities to experience uh, risk and change rather than seeking uh, compulsive safety and, and comfort. So I wrote about this, as uh, Jill said, in uh, Psychology Today in the columns called Neanderthink on various topics. And uh, we started a, a group, uh, non-clinicians, interestingly. Uh, uh, this is uh, pronounced apes. It's um, association of, uh, um, a, 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 what is it? A, a applied Evolutionary Psychology Society. That's it. Um, so we look at feeling displaced from your tribe. Oh, one minute. Uh, so let me just quickly go. These are some of the uh, subjects that we've discussed in um, evolutionary psychology. You can see these uh, have a lot of uh, sex differences. Um, you know, we're, we're, we overlap psychologically, but it's not the same. Mate value, we differ on charm and IQ and desirability. Uh, we better deal with that. Uh, attention deficit disorder, um, let's go. Uh, you can try this on yourself, social signaling. If you know what you're dealing with, uh, you can say, as Steven Pinker did, my genes can go jump in a lake. So a wedding is a, a good place to learn about human nature. And the other fig figure at attendance in my wedding, besides my wife, um, was Charles Darwin. Here, the first evolutionary psychologist seen presiding over us. And thank you.
those of you who are going over to Wheeler uh, to hear Skyler, go ahead, and um, we'll have time to take two questions in the interim. Okay? Thanks. Any questions for Nando? Yes. Yes, lifestyle changes. I always ask uh, clients uh, what they have for breakfast, uh, what, uh, what their sleep patterns are, uh, do they take vitamin D, do they get out, um, do they meet other people. Um, yeah, the, ev the evolutionary uh, uh, and ancestral approach just brings all that in. It's not just you know, what's in here, because evolution doesn't stop at the neck. It's, it's everything. Oh, um, I was wondering, so um, some people can experience trauma and not get PTSD, and some do. Are some of us evolutionary, evolutionarily just kind of uh, programmed to be more responsive to trauma almost? Or? Not, not programmed, but disposed. So I like to look at um, getting less traumatized. So, so you're right, some people are uh, a bit more vulnerable to certain types of uh, uh, stimuli and um, what I look at is how do we get out of that and understanding it from an ancestral point of view and how we differ today is a key part of that. Um, we're going uh, to end it here and take a little break and then come back in a few minutes. Thanks.